Morning, everybody. Glad to see you again. Go ahead and stand and we'll continue worship. Let's sing together. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself, carried the cross. Love so Surrender. 
I will sing for you alone have rescued this life. Jesus, you have set me free. And you alone took away all sin and disgrace. When you gave your life to ransom me, I am forgiven at the foot of the cross. I am accepted by the power of your love. My every stain is washed away. I am forgiven. So here I stand in the light of your glory and grace heaven's love and justice be now i live for the one who's called me by name who is risen and alive in me i am forgiven at the foot of the cross i am accepted by the power of your love, by every stain is washed away. I am forgiven.
invite you to be seated as we begin to prepare our hearts for our guys come forward to receive our offering this morning. Oh, my goodness, my goodness, my goodness. If that doesn't excite you, singing about his love and his mercy and his grace this morning, how he loves us. If that doesn't excite you this morning, then something's wrong. I'm not deserving of his love, but he loved me anyway. Father, we bow before you this morning. First of all, just giving you praise, honor, and glory, and thanks. Thanksgiving this morning. come to this place and we can freely, freely sing of your love and your praise and your glory without fear or reservation. We can lift our voices to you. Father, we pray as we receive this offering this morning, Lord, that it would honor you. Lord, thank you for how you've honored us this week, how you've blessed us, and how you've monetarily given to us, Lord. And we know that it's all yours. It's not ours. It's yours, Lord. But now we are given this opportunity to just give a portion back to you, to continue the ministries in this place that you've laid upon our hearts and the things that you have for us to do here, Lord. So bless this time. We don't take it lightly. We don't take it lightly at all. Just honor. Through the gifts and the givers this morning. Lord, we praise you and we glorify you. We give you all the honor. In your name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Well, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise today. So good to see you this morning. So glad that you're here with us today. We'll be continuing in Ephesians chapter 5 in just a few moments, but before we get to our, our time of studying in the Word today, um, so good to be back with you. Uh, last weekend, we were uh, in Eastern Kentucky with our students ministering uh, on a mission trip there and doing our uh, annual summer advance and spending time with students investing and pouring into them and, and teaching and serving with them. And and what a tremendous, tremendous week that we had there uh, over just outside of Boonville, Kentucky. Uh, our kids uh, did some landscaping work, brought a lot of stone and rock out of a, out of a creek to do for a, a church that is actually growing there and ministering to that community. Uh, pulled out some uh, carpet out of a church building. Their church building had been flooded, and we did that, and uh, put up some walls for a new addition onto their church. And, and our, our kids dug about a I don't know, a 125-yard ditch uh, for an electrical line that was that was laid in the ground, and and so a lot of a lot of sweat and a, a lot of uh, long hot days, a uh, little rest, uh, but it was a good week, a really good week. And then Tuesday night, uh, we had the opportunity to uh, to show the new uh, Tim Tebow directed movie that just recently came out. I think it's called Run the Race, something like that. And so we showed that film uh, to the church there. It had a uh, like a drive-in movie theater, big screen and projector. We showed the movie, and after the movie, a, a man gave his life to the Lord. And so we just yeah, give the Lord a hand clap of praise for that. I mean, a man knelt and was under conviction of the Spirit, and uh, uh, really, 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 really neat time. And just very thankful for uh, Cheyenne and Alyssa and and their servant leadership, and and just how how they how they led and how they loved and how they served. You know, guys, we're just really so blessed uh, to have them and their lives, their ministry, their family here with us at First Missionary. And and uh, it was just really, really neat to, to be with them and to serve. So we appreciate you guys so, so much. And uh, God just reminded me of the great need to, uh, to even uh, come along our student ministry in even a greater capacity to show support and love and, and to give of our time and uh, invest in the lives of students. Uh, it just 
it, it makes a tremendous difference. And, and before that, you know, vacation Bible school. Oh, my gosh. I can't say enough about vacation Bible school. I mean, it was really, really a, a great experience, let me tell you. You're thinking, who is this guy up in the pulpit today, right? Who is that guy up there? He's got glasses and he's got a bald head. I'm really concerned about how this is going out over the internet right now. I'm just being honest with you. Uh, I'll probably look as bald as I can be right now. So you guys, uh, if you got any Photoshop editing that you can do, I'd appreciate that. Um, but man, what a great week we had at Bible school. Man, just really appreciate everyone for supporting that and being a part of that. I got a highlight video I'm going to show you here in just a second. But uh, we did something really neat at Vacation Bible School. And my heart and my mind goes back to just a couple of months ago when, when our church uh, looked at some of the financial challenges that we have. And, and everyone's heart just kind of sunk when we realized that we would not be able to support some of those missions in the way that we've always been able to do that because of some of our current challenges that we have. And so weeks leading up to Vacation Bible School, I was having a discussion with Jay and Trista, more specifically Jay, and uh, we were talking about what are we going to do for missions giving during Bible school? What mission will we support, will we look at? And it just seemed like God was saying, why don't you look at those ministries and those missions which we normally support in our budget that, that we're not able to support like we've always been able to support? What if we looked at most of those, like four or five, six of those? And during vacation Bible school, all the funding that we raise will give to those missions and those ministries. So it's like, hey, that's a great idea. Let's, let's do that. So Monday night rolls around, vacation Bible school, missions giving. You know, I mean, you know, not a whole lot of change came in that night, Monday night. And so Jay and I were sitting out in the parking lot. And, and I said, you know, every year in Bible school, you know, there's a boys representative and a girls representative and and if the, if the boys win, then, you know, the girls' representative gets a pie in the face. And, and then vice versa. So if the girls win, the boys' representative gets a pie in the face. And so we're like, Jay's like, hey, we got to come up with something better than that. You know, that's kind of old. You know, that's kind of worn out. Let's do something different. So we stood there for a minute right out there after Bible school, and we were kicking some ideas back and forth. I'll I, I tell you one thing that we can do. You know, the loser goes into the pond. We'll do that. Loser goes into the pond. Yeah, I think the kids would probably like to see, you know, somebody go into the pond, right? And people get, can get behind that. And then Jay looked at me. He said, why don't we shave your head? <laughs> and I'm like, what? He said, yeah. He said, I think the kids would probably be willing to give the missions to, you know, see you shave your head. And I'm like, do you think I like my hair? Do you think I, you know, think a lot of my hair? I mean, you know, what are you really trying to tell me here? And yeah, he said, I, I think you should, you should shave your head. I said, that's going to cost a lot of money. <laughs> and so um, we kicked around a few number totals there of what it would cost for me to shave my head. And so that night I went home and this is, this is Monday night. So that night I went home and just thought about it and just thought about it. You know, maybe I prayed, maybe I didn't. I don't know. I just thought about it. Right. And so I came back. Tuesday on the stage and still hadn't made up my mind really but in the moment on the stage I said I'll tell you what if all if all of you kids if you collectively if you collectively raise five thousand dollars then I'll take a mohawk I'll, I'll let I'll let whoever on this stage give me a mohawk five thousand dollars but for seven thousand dollars you can shave my head for $7,000. So this is Tuesday night. So the missions offering had, I mean, they were already there. So it's not like, you know, they had time for prayer. So this is Tuesday night. We make the announcement Tuesday night. Well, Wednesday, you know, a little bit more money comes in. Then on Thursday, Thursday afternoon, maybe $2,500 had been given. And I'm thinking, I'm in the clear. You know, I don't have, I, I really don't have a, I don't have anything to worry about. Now, don't get me wrong. I wanted to see a large missions offering. And the biggest that we had ever had that I can remember was probably about $1,500, maybe $2,000. And we're at $2,500, so we've already got the largest missions offering we've ever had. So I'm like, hey, we're good. I'm good. 
not worried about anything. So during closing, I come up on the stage just like normal. You know, Trista, our missions maniac, comes out, and she gives the big report of the boys, what the boys have brought in. 400 and some odd dollars. I'm, hey, that's great. You know, rarely do we see 400 dollars. Hey, that's great. I'm going excited crazy. And then she says, and the girls. Well, let's hear what the girls brought in. And I'm, I'm right over here, and I'm thinking, hey, I'm in the clear. I'm not sweating anything. 4,000, blah, 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 blah. Some odd dollars. Four. I'm, so my mind, I'm starting doing the math. And you can hear me under my breath over my little speaker going, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. I mean, I'm like right over there. And then she says, oh, and, then she's, and she builds this whole thing up and says, you know, and remember the deal, you know, $5,000, you know, he gets a mohawk. And my, 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 I'm going with my math, and I'm a little slow with math, but I'm like, I'm definitely getting a mohawk. And then she says, the grand total, $7,240 in change. And I just wilted. I'm like, oh, my gosh, it is going to happen. So they had a big time. They shaved my head. And, and, yes, it was much shorter than what it is. It's just all this miracle grow I've been putting on it. I mean, it's just amazing what happens, how it's coming back. Yeah, that, that, was, that, was, that was definitely the moment. That was definitely the moment. So, anyway, uh, and what's interesting about that is when you take the majority of those ministries and missions that we normally support what we collected through vacation bible school is more than what we would have given through our budget you tell me the lord's not good you tell me the lord is not good and we had big mountains to climb we've had some and the first one was bible school itself and i i, I challenged the church to uh, to, to raise $6,000 and, and us not have to touch our, uh, our budget for Bible school. And in two weeks, God raised $10,000 for Bible school. And then during two days, two days of Bible school, and apparently folks were coming in and on the phone and keeping up with totals and all this stuff. Uh, and then in Bible school, you know, our absolute largest ever missions giving that we had of over $7,200. So, Two big mountains that, that came in front of us. God met the need. And, and now I just want to say to the church family, you know, we still have mountains to climb. We really do. I mean, every room in this building, you know, was used for Bible school. There were some classrooms that, that uh, the teachers asked the guides to leave because it was so cramped and, and small in there. And I just really believe with all my heart that God has more more for us here and and things that he wants us to do but it's hard to do those things when we have these financial challenges that are in front of us but if god will continue to raise up people to be faithful in their giving to our regular budget our regular operating expenses missions needs have been met if god will just continue to raise up and put on your heart to continue to give and to give above and beyond, then, then I really believe that other mountains are going to fall. And we're going to see God do great things. But, but I've never seen God do great things apart from his people. He always moves and works through our hearts and our lives. He involves us and he uses us in that process. So, big encouragement. We're very thankful for where we are today. And can't wait to see what God's going to do. But anyway, we've got a highlight video for Vacation Bible School. We want you to see this morning. And so just get back and enjoy. And by the way, nine kids made decisions for Christ during Vacation Bible School. Nine kids. <laughs> to either accept Christ for the first time or follow him in believer's baptism. Which means we'll be doing a baptism class toward the end of the summer. Probably going to do another late baptism event at Jonathan Creek. Uh, and do that at the end of the summer for these kids. So... Just great, great, great. Thank you, church, for coming and supporting uh, people who provided food and everything else. And it was just an amazing week at Bible school. Here's some highlights of the week.
I just want to say thank you to Brother Allen. He has been so professional through this process and he always keeps the children in line. Oh, well, they didn't get permission to show some of that, by the way. Oh, just give God another hand clap of praise. Just thank him. So good. So much fun. So much fun. And, you know, uh, there were actually folks, reminded me in that video, folks who were here ministering and counseling students who, who led students to faith in Christ who had never had that opportunity before. And, and to be there, it's almost like, ah, gosh, it's like in the delivery room and, and to be with a kid. When they give their life to the Lord. Wow, okay, sorry. But yeah, folks got that opportunity, and it, and it changed their lives. So that's just neat, neat stuff, and so we're very, very thankful. So anyway, let's go to Ephesians chapter 5 as you turn over there. I want to remind you that our fellowship in fireworks uh, has, was rescheduled. We got rained out Wednesday night. That's happening tonight on the church property at 830. And my good friend who's, gonna, who's got a Kona ice, like shaved ice truck, uh, no pun intended. Anyway, he's going to be coming uh, tonight and set up his truck for all the kids to have shaved ice. And so uh, proceeds from that go to local charities and missions. And so it's going to be a great night on the property. Bring blankets, lawn chairs. It's going to be really, really fun tonight. Fireworks and Fellowship, First United Methodist, Central Church of Christ. I've invited others to come and be a part. So come tonight uh, around 830-ish. It's going to be an awesome, awesome time here tonight. Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to continue today. In this series, we're actually going to wrap up a big section of this this morning um, in this series, Family Vacay, vacating the attitudes and habits that wreck our families. And, and I admit, we haven't spent a whole lot of time talking about what some of those specific attitudes or habits are. But I think what we have done is we've presented attitudes and habits that are needed and, and hopefully whatever those negative or bad uh, bad habits and attitudes are that is you come to embrace what is true and what is wise and what is good then embracing those will help move out and will help eradicate those that are negative that might be wrecking your home, about how we look at our spouse, how we view marriage and family life in general, uh, what is the picture or relationship uh, that God wants to give us when we think, okay, what does it really look like for a man to love his wife? And what does it really look like for a, a, a woman to, to honor and to respect her husband. And if you struggle with any of those concepts or ideas, I think God, by giving us a picture, really helps us in this. It's a, it's a, it's a picture built around Christ, that Christ's love for the church, a husband's love for his wife, is to, to reflect and to look like Christ's love for the church, and that a wife's honor and respect toward her husband is to look something like the church's honor and respect for Christ. So it's Christological. Christ is the center, and he presents us the picture. And something else that's really important is in this is that when a husband and a wife are properly relating to one another, and you can say a healthy, godly, biblical marriage. When that's happening, the gospel is reflected in that relationship. Because of all the relationships God could have used to say, hey, this is what my relationship say to Israel or Christ's relationship 
to the church. A marriage, for him to choose marriage as that picture, it stands to reason that the enemy, the spiritual enemy, and all the forces of the world and the evil one would want to come against that. And not just take it so personal that, well, the enemy just hates our marriages. Why? Why does he want to destroy and erode family life? It's not so much that he hates you or your marriage or your family, but he hates the gospel. And so when there's breakdowns in marriages and families, there's something to the gospel, a sense of the gospel that is lost. From the very get-go of this series, we said that the relationship between a man and his wife, the marital relationship, is the foundation of the home. But there's something even deeper than that. And it's Jesus Christ. He is, he is the true foundation. Because in marriage life, there's so many challenges and problems. And, and let's be honest, there's breakups and there's difficulties that people go, well, you know, if, if, if my marriage falls apart, what do I have? What can I fall back on? Do I have a hope of a future? Is there something there? And the answer is yes. It's Christ who heals and mends and redeems all the brokenness that happens above the line. But yet, when you look at this section of Scripture called the house codes, the relationship between a husband and a wife, they are the starting block, if you will, for the family. The book of Ephesians, and I've been studying it all weekend for the last three or four days and took time to get a notebook and just write the book out, just write it word for word so I can become very intimate with it. The book of Ephesians is really about a large chasm, a large chasm between Israel and Gentile people. And the heart of the book is about how God, through the person of Christ, bridges the chasm. In fact, he doesn't just build a bridge. He eliminates the chasm. He brings the two together into one. And so the heart of the book as a whole is a heart of unity. And then you see this unity played out in loving, caring, giving relationships. And in one of my notes, I wrote out to the side, thinking about how this community looks like. What we'd call the body of Christ or the church. I just wrote out, who wouldn't want to be a part of a community like this, where people love each other, care for each other, they have each other's backs, they subject to one another, they're full of the Spirit. You know, they're not selfish, but they're selfless. And their actions and decisions are always about what somebody else gets out of it. Who wouldn't want to be a part of a community like that? And then in the heart of that, Paul drops... A special word to wives and then to husbands. A part of that loving, self-giving community. And I will tell you right now, and I think every married couple will tell you, and, and even for our young men and young ladies who, man, I got to spend this past week with, and you may think, you know, marriage is, hopefully for y'all, it's like a long way, long way away. But... Selfish people don't survive marriage. They don't. And I use the word survive because everything about the marital, marital relationship beckons selflessness. So selfish people really struggle when it comes to healthy marriage and family life. So when it comes time for you and you're thinking seriously about your future, I don't want to say pick wisely because it's not so much like, well, I'll pick this one or I'll pick that one. It's, it doesn't work that way. But just pray that God gives you great wisdom. And, and I'm going to say this to you guys, okay? Do not be praying for 
oh God, make that person I'm supposed to marry what they need to be for me. That is the wrong prayer. Pray, God, make me what I need to be first. For whoever you bring along into my life. And, and yes, Lord, I pray that you're molding and shaping them after your heart too. But Lord, I want to be, I want to be that kind of person when somebody else thinks about dating or a serious relationship, they at least say, you know what? She might not be the one or he may not be the one, but God, I hope that the person you bring into my life is like that one. Because I've seen in him or her the level-headedness, the heart for the Lord, the wisdom, what is needed in this relationship. So Paul starts out in verse 22 with wives out of the heart of being subject to one another in the fear of Christ, the whole body of Christ. He says, wives, be subject to your own husbands. And then quickly he moves down to verse 25 where we were two weeks ago with husbands, love your wives. Very simple. What is a man supposed to do? In regards to his wife. He's supposed to love her. Pretty easy, right? And this is how he loves her. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So God doesn't just tell us and encourage us to love our wives. He gives us a picture of what that love looks like. You know, back in 1984... There was a song that came out by a group. And I love this song um, because I really think this song expresses the heart and the desire of the culture. It's by a group called Foreigner. Have you ever heard of Foreigner? But anyway, um, at some point they're going to, there we go. Yeah. Y'all remember this? Yeah, some of you, just for a moment, close your eyes, go back to 1984. Some of you are going, I wasn't even born in 1984. I got to take a little time, a little time to uh, think things over. I better read between the lines in case I need it when I'm older. Yeah, I'm not going to sing it. No way. This mountain I must climb feels like the world upon my shoulders through the clouds. I see love shine. It keeps me warm as life grows colder. And, And then this next part, I think, really hits where some of us are today. I really do. In my life, there's been heartache and pain. I don't know if I can face it again. I'm not someone who's given up on this concept or idea of love. But then the refrain, I can't stop now. I've traveled so far to change this lonely life. And then then what's the heart of the song? Remember the chorus of of this song? Come on, y'all sing it. Y'all go ahead. That's all right. We'll have an 80s moment, okay? Yeah, so I can see, I can see all the guys in Ephesus, right? I can see all the guys in Ephesus, and, and Paul drops it down, says, husbands, love your wives, and then all the guys break out in Foreigner 1984, right? I want to know what love is. I want you to show me. God says, and God says, okay, I will. I will show you. This is what it looks like. He says, as, as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. And this love here, we looked at it a couple of weeks ago, is not like some of the loves that they would know in their culture back in Paul's day. I mean, they had a different word for di- they had a different word for every expression of love. In our culture, we just got one, we just have one word. But for romantic love, sexual love, they had eros. For brotherly love, friendship love, they had phileo. And there's about five or six others that we looked at two weeks ago. This word is very special. It's unique. This is the word agape. And if you want to know what agape is, then yes, this is Christ loving the church and gave himself up for her. Agape love is an unconditional, self-sacrificing love. And the part I really want to hit on right now is the unconditional aspect of this. Unconditional in the sense that the object 
that's receiving the love has done nothing to deserve or earn the love. Let me say that again. This love, this unconditional, selfless love, is a love that acts when the object of the love has done nothing. I'll say that again. Has done nothing to earn or to achieve the love. Paul expresses this so clearly in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Again, we look at the heart of Christ and how Christ has unconditionally loved us. Look at this, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates His own what? His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners... Before our redemption, before our redemption, sinners, having done nothing or could do nothing to earn or achieve the love, Christ died for us. Husbands, love your wives even when. She has done nothing to earn, deserve, or try to achieve your love. This is love. This is what love looks like. It is a love that is wrought out of a choice. So even when, guys, even when she is not eros or eros in love back to you, Sexual, romantic, attractive love. And even when she is not phileoing brotherly, friendship, companion love back to you. And for some of us guys, we'd be like, well, it's easy if she's eros, isn't it? And it's easy if she's phileoing all this. And, and, and yeah, I can love her then. But no, God says, no, 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 no. You love her. Even when those other expressions are not coming back to you because this is how Christ has loved us and if you have received his love of you and for you then you know this love it's in you from the heart of God to you by virtue of your Life in Christ. And when you walk with Christ and you're intimate and close to Him, what's He going to speak? Through your life. He will speak unconditional, selfless love through you. And it will be as natural as breathing. Years ago, and I've shared this before, and I think Emily's okay with me sharing this. And uh, if I get some things wrong, she'll correct me later in the car, but that's okay. Years ago, early on in our relationship, we were at kind of a, a, a critical point. And I mean critical in the sense of, after a while, you kind of need to get, you're either serious about this thing or you're not. You either move on, you know, or you, you know, you, you take it up another level, right? You, you think about it differently. Maybe there's other commitments that come along. Y'all know what I'm talking about? There, back in cold water, there's an expression, but it's not fitting for the pulpit. But anyway, you either got to move on or do something different. And I can remember we were at this critical point, and we were challenged, and I was frustrated, and I'm sure she was frustrated, and everything. And one night, it was at that point to where I was like, okay, God, I need to really hear from you on this deal. I need you to, to really speak clearly to me on this because it's at a point to where it's either make or break. And so I went to the steps of the church that I was attending at the time because I, I just really felt like I needed to get as close to God. Not, not like God lived there or anything like that. I, I didn't understand a lot of things I know now, but I knew I needed to be close to the Lord. So I went to the steps of the church and I sat down 
And I said, God, if you will give me the green light, I can walk away. But I need you to give me the green light. And, I'm, and it's okay. And I'm sure she'll probably be okay too. And I'm telling you, it was as clear as me hearing my voice right now. The Spirit of God said, go back and love her. That's all he said. He didn't say, watch this, he didn't say, go and talk to her about this and talk to her about this, that. He didn't say, go and you need to address this or you need to address that. Or he didn't say, go and you need to correct this and correct that and you need to, you need to do this. Nothing. Nothing. All he said was, go love her. And I did. Now, I really didn't know what it meant. But I did. And the rest is history. But there is a power. I'm telling you, there is a power to this love that is transformative. It's transformative. Because listen to how this plays out in the text in regards to Christ's love for the church. Verse 26. That he might sanctify her to set her apart, to make her special and unique having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word. And it's, it's the presence of truth that Christ brings to the church and how He cleanses her. And, and gosh, we sang this morning about how He has washed every stain. Every stain is removed. We sang about that in our relationship to Christ. That He might present to Himself the church, it seems eschatological. We're thinking to the future. We're thinking about the future. What is to come? What is to come? He loves her in such a way He anticipates what is to come? That he might, verse 27, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. Having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. And it's really interesting to me why Paul brings up spots and wrinkles. Because I would think that for most of you ladies... As you age gracefully in life, there's probably not a morning where you get up and you say, oh dear Lord, I hope I have more spots today. And you look in the mirror and you say, oh, I had 10 wrinkles yesterday. Now I have 12. Glory to God in the highest. I mean, I'm just imagining it probably doesn't work that way, right? No, in fact, we have a multi-billion dollar industry in cosmetics that help to hide or cover spots and or wrinkles. The word cosmetic comes from the word cosmos, which means to order or to adorn. It speaks, it speaks to the art of beautification. Paul says that Christ's love for the church is so transformative that it removes spots and wrinkles. And this is set in comparison and back and forth to a husband's love for his wife. A husband's love for his wife is to be transformative love. It's cosmetic. And it's better than cosmetic. It's better than cosmetic. As it reflects Christ's selflessness, as that is demonstrated back into her life, it doesn't just enhance her relationship with her husband, it enhances her understanding of the gospel. Wow. Guys, we get to minister through our unconditional sacrificial love. We're ministering back to our wives a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So her affection will go toward Christ because we demonstrate selfless love. And it's futuristic in the sense that the church, the bride, is being presented back to Christ. So, so maybe, just maybe, just maybe, 
of all the things that might aggravate or irritate or challenge us or bring us to the point of saying, well, I'm not going to love you because blah, 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 blah. Maybe if we just love. Just love in this way. All those things over time will be addressed. And here's the thing, too. As we husbands, as we men seek to love in this way, we can only look to Christ to show us how to do this. So here's what happens. He orders all of our junk. He orders all of our stuff. And then we love our wives, and then she's pointed to Christ, and then Christ orders all of her stuff. And He orders all of her junk. And then we're presented back to each other. We go, wow, this is really cool. A neat work's been done in your life. A neat work has been done in my life. I didn't do it. I just loved you. And she says, well, I didn't do it. I just honored and respected you. Who did it? The Lord did this. Because it's transformative. And it stands to reason that a husband will love his wife in this way. Verse 28, we're going to wrap up. So husbands, it stands to reason. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife is really loving himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church because we are members of his body. And in verse 31, he hearkens back to that Genesis passage where Eve is presented to Adam. And in the first marriage we have in Scripture, that covenantal commitment, back in Genesis chapter 2, Paul reiterates, for this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. One flesh is, is a, it's one emotionally, yes, physically, one spiritually. It's a, it's a true coming together to where he acts in head of loving and nourishing. She responds as body, but it's really one. So as one does to the other, they affect themselves. As one does to the other, they affect themselves. As one does to the other, they affect themselves. He says, this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, last word, let each individual among you also love his own wife, even as himself. And let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. Man, as he loves her in this way and he selflessly gives him himself. And the work of Christ is happening in her life and the work of Christ is happening in his life because he's submitting to Christ in order to show her this love. And then Christ is doing this work within them and toward both of them. What kind of wife would not readily show respect and honor to a man who loves her like Jesus. And what man would not readily show this kind of love toward a wife who honors and respects him as Christ responds to the church, as the church responds to Christ? So guys, what do we do? What do we do? We love our wives. That's what we do. I know that some of us today, this is hard. This is hard. I know that. And I know that a lot of people would really like a do-over in relationships. I know that. Just so thankful that Christ restores, redeems, gives hope, points us to a better tomorrow. Restores, redeems, gives hope, points us to a better tomorrow. But if we're coming out of brokenness, then hopefully, by hearing His Spirit today, we can be so much better prepared for where He's 
taken our lives in the future. And irrespective of the situation or condition of your marriage today, no matter how great you think it is or how challenging you think it is, let the Spirit of Christ speak to you where you are now and hope for a better tomorrow. And trust that through the transformative power of God working through your life, it will come to you. It will come your way. So as we stand today, our prayer counselors are going to slip out and come forward. I would think, I would just think, that if I was a lady, I would think, that I would be going, okay, Holy Spirit of God, here I am. Show me. Teach me how I can unconditionally love my husband. What is it? What is it that speaks honor? What is it that speaks respect back to him? How might he see Christ in me? As I do that. I cannot help what he does. I cannot help anything about him, Lord. I can only, I can only, I can only submit myself to you first. And then trust you. To lead me. To be the wife. That is needed in my home. So here I am, Lord. Show me what speaks honor, what speaks respect, and what doesn't. And give me strength and wisdom to walk in you. And if I'm a man, I'm sitting here going, okay, God, here I am. Show me how to love my wife. Show me daily what speaks selflessness to her. What speaks honor to her. What uh, is it about my love toward her that could even be transformative and, and helpful and beneficial that points her to Christ? What would it be about me that would make my wife say at the end of the day, thank you, God, for this man in my life. God, I'm so thankful you put this man in my life. There is not another man on this planet who loves me like this man does. There's no one who could. I think if I'm a guy, that's where I am with this. So as we go into this time of response, you respond as the Spirit leads you to respond in your life.